Hey class, this video is going to help with 12.4, our last section in Math 1000. Okay, so what is this one about? It's about normal distributions. So give me a sec, let me share my screen. And we're going to open this up. Okay, so 12.4, the normal distribution. So the first thing we're going to learn about is our Z score. There we go. My picture's in the way. So the Z score. So we've been looking at standard deviation, and this is showing us how spread out our data is. So the Z score will tell us how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. So how many deviations you are from the mean. If I am up two standard deviations, from the mean, I'm way above the average. If I'm below, if I'm in the negative, I'm um, at negative maybe three standard deviations. I am way, way, way lower than the mean. So one thing to note is your z-score goes from negative three to three. So negative means you're below the, the mean and positive means you're above the mean, okay? So z-score, how are we gonna calculate this? So what we do is we take your personal data item, we subtract the mean, and we divide by the standard deviation. And that's gonna tell me about where you are is in terms of um, what, where you are in terms of deviations away from the mean. Okay, so for example, um, well, let's say, our mean, remember that symbol means mean, is seven, and S of X, our sample standard deviation, is one. Okay, so that's our data that we're given from our population. Then we go over here and we say, all right, I'm at a nine. Where am I compared to this data? What is my Z-score? What I would do then is I would take the nine, my data, and I would subtract the seven, the mean, and divide by the standard deviation. So nine minus seven is two. Two divided by one is two. So what does that mean? I am means I am two full standard deviations above the mean. Remember, six, well, you'll learn, but 68% of the people are one standard deviation away. So this actually means I'm 95% I am at 95% above everybody else. So super high. So let's look at another value. What if I'm at five? Same mean, same standard deviation. Then I would take my number five, subtract the seven, divide by the one, and I get a negative two. So now I am two standard deviations below the mean. What if I'm right at seven? I'm right at seven. What does that mean? Well, seven minus seven is zero. Zero divided by one is still zero. I am right on the middle. So if your z-score is zero, you are equal with everybody else. You're right in the middle. Um, as it gets bigger, you're above. As it gets negative, you're below. Okay, so hopefully that helps with the z-score. Um, so let's look at one, uh, one of a problem straight from the homework. So an IQ test have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 16. What score corresponds with a z-score of negative 1.5? Ooh, so I went a little bit different way. So I was given the z-score. Um, so the way that I'm going to think about this is I don't know my score. But I know if I subtract 100 and I divide by 16, it better equal this z. And then I have to solve this equation. So this one's working backward a little, not like the first example. So I'd have to take this 16 over and times it because it's being divided by everything. You've got to times it over first to get negative 24. And then you're going to add the 100 over and you're going to get 76. Now look back, does that make sense? If I have a z-score of negative 1.5, I better be below the mean by two standard deviations. 
there you go, I am. I'm below the mean two standard deviations. Okay, well, a standard, not two full standard deviations, I guess it's one and a half on this one. Another way I could have done that is I could have thought of one deviation 16, a half is eight. So I could have gone 16 plus eight, right? It gives me 24 and take the 100 and minus 24, and that would give me the 76 as well. So that was another way to think through this one. I, um, this is using the formula. Okay, so if I have a z-score of 2.05 for the same IQ, well, same one. So this one's a little harder because it's 0 0.05, it's not 1.5. So I'm gonna still set up the formula for it because it's a little easier that way. So you still do it the same way. You times by the 16, that gives me this, and then you have to add over the 100. So if I have a z-score of 2.05, my IQ is 132.4. That is such a good IQ score. I don't even know what my IQ score is, but um, I'm sure I'm a shady middle, 100. So um, that's where we're gonna get that one from is, and that one's above. So it makes sense because it was a two. So it's above the hundred by um, almost two full standard deviations. Yeah, but you could figure out 0 0.05 of it and do it that way too. If you don't know what I'm talking about, do it the way I just showed you. Okay, what if I say you're in the nth percentile? So I, I, I have data. And I say you're in the nth percentile, or maybe I say you're in the 50 percentile, or maybe I say you're in the 60 percentile. I am saying um, wherever you're at, so if I say you're in the 95 percentile, all 95% um, of the people are below you. So if you take a standardized test like ACT, ACT um, or any of those, and you look at where you're at, you could see whether or not you are above or below. Excuse me, and they give you your percentile. Like I think I, I was right in the middle, somewhere in the 50s, so right? I'm a 50 percentile person. But that'd be pretty cool if you scored in the 99 percentile on your ACT. That'd be 99% of the people are below you. Oof, okay. A student is in the 78th percentile on a test. What does that mean? That means 78 people are below them. 78% of the people are below them. Okay, so here we get a little bit tricky on this next idea. So to be normally distributed, now this is a huge idea and you really need to get this down now if you're taking statistics. So take a little extra time, watch a couple extra videos if mine wasn't clear enough to make sure you really get this. But the normal distributed data is, um, has a mean, median, and mode that are, are equal or really close to equal. So if I have 5.9, six, and six, those are close, and two of them are equal. Um, we also look at a bell-shaped histogram. So those two things tell us our data is normal. So then we have to look at our table here. If we have a bell shape, there's lots of things we can tell. So typically with our bell shaped, you have the mean down the middle, not typically, the mean is down the middle. See, there's my mean symbol. When I go plus one, minus one, that is referring to the z-scores or the standard deviation. I have added a standard deviation. So look what happens when I add one standard deviation in both directions from the mean, okay? I have picked up 68% of the people in my sample or my population. If I go out two standard deviations, I have now picked up 95% of the people. So, um, if I've gone out three standard deviations, I have now picked up 99.7% of the people. So write this down. 
This, these numbers here, I like, that's just the breakdown. If I broke 68 in half, that's 34 and 34. If I took 95, subtracted off the 68 and broke it in half, I would get these two numbers. And same with these two numbers. So I just broke it up for you. So I, if I, we know that if we were right here in the middle, then half the people are below, half the people are above. But if I said you were right here, you could say that you're at, um, what is that, 30, 40, uh, not 30. If I said I'm right here, I'm 50% plus 34 plus 13.5, okay, is where I would be um, if I was right here, that many people would be below me, okay? Um, I'll do some more examples definitely using that. Another thing I really want to mention is when we want to look at this bell shape, we need to look at a histogram. Okay, my histogram should be unimodal. It should means it should go up and then back down just like a bell. Now it doesn't matter if it's a little bit off, that's fine. Um, and or if you have big ones or small ones like this. Okay, these both show they're bell shaped. If your bell has a little bit of a tail that goes to the right, we call it right skewed. If the tail goes to the left, we call it left skewed. So it would go up and then tail away or go up and then tail away. Okay. So what do we have to look at for this? Mean, median, mode, are they close? We have to look at the histogram. Okay. So you have to be able to draw a histogram to tell me if something is normally distributed. So let's look at a couple problems that are going to use this. Okay, so if I said I have a mean of 70 and I said I have, I feel like it needs to focus a little. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so if I said to make a bell shape with this information. The first thing I'm gonna do, I don't wanna show the answer yet. I, first thing I'm gonna do, do is draw my bell. And what should go in the middle? Your mean, 70, right? So half the people are above, half the people are below my 70. What if I wanna go up one deviation and down one deviation? What do I do? I take 70 and I add four, 74. Take 70, subtract four, I get 66. That is one standard deviation. How many people does that represent that are between, so if I look at my data, how, what percent of the people are between 66 and 74? 68. So 68% of the people are between 66 and 74. So maybe this is a test and this, that'd be great. This looks like, yeah, let's say that. This looks like data for a, um, for uh, school. So we'll say the average was a 70 and that 68% of the people are between these two. Let's go up one more deviation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we add four, that gives me 78. Subtract four and I get 62. What percent of the people are between 62 and 78? 95. 95% of the people would be between those two data. Okay, one more, add and I get 82 subtract and I get 58, um, subtract and add that four again. And now between a 58 and an 82, it almost picks up everyone. 99.7% of the people are between this number and this number. Okay, so I, it's the same here. I just wanted to write it out so you didn't see the whole answer. Okay, so you'll have to do something like that on the next exam as well. So. Uh, make sure you're understanding that. Okay, what number is two standard deviations above the mean on our example we just did? Like that, there we go. It's going to have to be 78. If I didn't have my chart, I could make a chart easily, or I could just add two standard deviations to my mean 
to get to that 78. Half the data is below what number? 70, the middle, the mean. 84% of the data is below what number? Well, I kind of gave it away because you could see it, but 84% is kind of a weird one. So let's look back at what we had here. If we notice we're at 50, what happens if we add this little portion here and stop here? So we're including all of this 50 plus this, I would be at 84. So we're looking at one above. So with this, that's where the 74 comes from. That's one above the mean, okay? So it was the 50% plus the 34, that almost looks like a 58%, but it really is 50 is where we got that. Okay, next one. If I'm if I'm given a new standard, um, excuse me, a new mean and standard deviation, what range of the data is represented uh, represents sixty eight percent of the data? So I have a new one. So take a second, pause the video, and see if you can tell me sixty eight percent of the data is between what two numbers? Okay, when you come back, you should have added that twelve and subtracted that twelve one standard deviation away from the mean. So it's between 88 and 112. Okay, all right. One last idea for this section is gonna be um, the margin of error. The margin of error is how many percent points your results will differ from the real population. How far am I off? So I'm taking a sample of a population, my random sample, and I'm calculating stuff from it. And this margin of error will tell me how far off I am um, from that true value if we would have got data from everybody, okay? So the way that I calculate this is I do plus or minus one divided by the square root of the sample size. So the bigger your sample size, the smaller your error. That's true for everything. So I see all this crazy stuff on Facebook and they're like, oh, this causes this. You know, um, a good one, I always go to cancer because that's just me. A good one was, um, well, a good one is pot curing cancer. And I said, I've had a lot of people tell me if I just smoked pot, it would have cured my cancer. And I said, how many people were in your sample size? Because I want to know <laughs> what's the margin of error on that. I've never met anyone who said that stuff to me. Um, show me data that, that it actually cures cancer. Now, it does help with um, getting someone to eat better in hemo and some other things. We're not talking about that. We're talking about cures. So there are a lot of medical places that use this um, idea of margin of error. Like how far off are you? So that's how we're gonna calculate it. So if I have an N value of 20, what is my margin of error? Okay, so don't forget the plus or minus. It is going to be, because it's going in either direction, you could be off, okay, plus or minus. So it'll be one over the square root of 20 is the number, and then when I times it by 100, it makes it a percent. So we are now 22.4% off in both directions. Oof, that's a that's huge error. So if I only have 20 people in my sample, I can't rely on that at all. It is not a good representation. So what does this mean? Um, this is kind of the fancy way they like it written. This means there is a 95% probability that the true population is within 22.4% of the mean. The 95% is there always. Okay, that's just part of this formula, this idea. So what if I have 5,000 people in my sample? Okay, then I do one divided by the square root of 5,000 times 100 in my calculator, and I get 1.41. Um, that should say plus or minus, add a plus or minus there, both directions. Look at the difference. Holy moly.
I'm only off 1.4% both ways. If I had 5,000 people in my survey, way, way better. The bigger the sample size, the less the error, the margin of error. Okay. One last example. If 70% of the 2,272 people enjoy walking at 95% confidence, what is the range of the true population statistic? Okay, that's kind of fancy talk here. And we are truly getting into some more of the stats. It's a little harder, but I do, I do want to show you one more example with this idea. What I can do is I can use that margin of error, okay, to um, add and subtract on my mean to get my confidence interval. So let me, let me walk you through this. So what is our margin of error? Well, we had 2,272 people in my study. So one plus or minus one divided by that times 100 tells me I'm 2.1% in both directions for my margin of error. Then what I do is I take the value that was given, which is 70%. Um, it could have been a mean to like it could have been 50% or something. That's a given number. And we add and subtract that number here, and that will give us our confidence interval. So what does that mean? We are 95% confident that everyone will be between these two values. <coughs> so what do you do? Take it, you find your margin of error and add and subtract it. Okay, I realize these last couple questions are a little harder. Um, please let me know if you need help with any of this. Big takeaway is the 68, 95, 99 rule, okay? Being able to draw that bell graph, that's important. Can you find a z-score? Do you understand what a z-score is? If it's positive, what's it telling you? If it's negative, what's it telling you? It's telling you you're above or below the mean, the average. You should also understand what a percentile is and that everyone's below you once you've hit that percentile. All those other people are below you. All right, good luck on your homework, last section.